Okay, why don't we start? Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Michael Birrell. I'm an infectious diseases physician. I have two roles. I work uh, predominantly for the Western Public Health Unit and I'll outline who we are in a second. But I also do work clinically as an infectious diseases physician at uh, Western Health and wanted to talk to you today um, with uh, the help of the Northwestern Melbourne PHN about Brulee Ulcer, providing an update uh, for GPs working in inner Melbourne. Um, and as we will talk about, Brulee Ulcer is a really hot topic at the moment, hitting the mainstream media, um, and want to make sure you are armed with all the right information and, and up-to-date knowledge of what's happening where. Just some quick housekeeping matters. Uh, I'll get to in a second, but first I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which our work takes place, the Wurundjeri Wurrung people, the Boon Wurrung people and the Wathaurong people. Um, we pay respects to elders past, present and emerging, as well as pay respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a session with us today. Uh, so just a quick uh, housekeeping, all attendees, attendees are muted in this webinar. Um, please ask any questions you have via the Q&A box, which you'll, you'll get on your Zoom menu. Um, and uh, I'll come back to them at the end and answer any questions there. This session is being recorded. You'll receive a link to the recording and a copy of the slides uh, afterwards. Um, and any question you ask will be asked anonymously for privacy reasons. Um, please ensure your Zoom name is the same name as your event registration because the PHM will use the Zoom participant list to mark attendance and, and certificates. And CPD won't be issued if we can't confirm the attendance. If you're not sure if your name matches, just uh, send a chat message to the NWM PHN uh, education to identify yourself. Okay, um, so what I want to talk today all about Borrelia Elsa is uh, sort of just under 30 minutes on really what I think uh, is important for you to know working in a general practice now in Melbourne. Um, so a bit about background about Borrelia Elsa, a little bit about the local epidemiology and transmission how to test for a Borrelia ulcer, a bit of an outline on management, and um, given uh, I'm working from a public health unit, a bit about prevention, uh, if you can give you know, relevant advice to give people who are asking you about it. Just quickly about us. So I work for the public health unit, which is one of nine local public health units set up in 2020, initially as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but now a response for broader public health actions of uh, population health and management of most notifiable conditions. We manage uh, not quite the exact same catchment as the North West Melbourne PHN, um, but do overlap a bit. So many of you will live in this area, um, essentially sending from Melbourne and Marybeck West to Melton and uh, Wyndham in the Werribee area that you can see there. Um, so apologies if anyone's eating lunch and I did, didn't give you a warning, but um, let's talk straight about Borrelia ulcer. So Borrelia ulcer, which you may know previously particularly by the name Bansdale ulcer or Daintree ulcer, um, is a necrotizing skin and soft tissue infection um, caused by a bacteria, Mycobacterium ulcerans. Uh, this is a very distant relative of other mycobacteria such as tuberculosis and leprosy, um, but is, is reasonably different from those other more, more prominent mycobacteria. It's an extremely slow growing bacteria. So once somebody's been uh, infected with it, um, it usually takes four to five months incubation period before they start showing any signs of infection. Um, and then it can take sort of weeks for it to grow big enough that they start to seek help through their GP, usually in the first instance. Um, that's one of the reasons that this time of year is why um, we start to see more and more of them and, and why you might've seen a bit about Borrelia ulcer in the news. Um, because people get sort of infected with it usually in summer and, and aut early autumn um, and then it's uh, only late in the year that they start presenting. And as you can see from this image, uh, there's really significant tissue destruction that can occur to it with it. Transition is uh, something that a lot of work and a lot of research has uh, been performed over the last uh, decade and, and last few years in particular. Um, and what I've shown is a graphic sort of highlighting the, the presumed transmission cycle in Melbourne and I really, or Victoria. And I really want to emphasize Victoria because um, it is possible to get Borrelia ulcer in a lot of other parts of the world, particularly some of Sub-Saharan Africa, and they seem to have a slightly different um, reservoirs and hosts. 
But uh, what we know from research that's been led by the Doherty Institute is that possums both carry and can get affected by mycobacterium ulcerans. There are plenty of possums that have uh, got signs of Borrelia ulcers on them and, and can be quite sick. And their uh, excreta, their stool, um, contains evidence of mycobacterium ulcerans. Not every possum, but many possums in affected areas. Um, so they're what we would call the host. And then um, mosquitoes uh, have also tested positive for mycobacterium ulcerans on PCR testing. And so they're presumed to be the vector. Um, in particular, uh, some of the studies have shown the mosquito Aedes nodescriptus, which is a super common, quite literally garden variety mosquito um, that is uh, often near sort of water sources um, and present all across Victoria. So um, they're thought to be the vector, the mosquito. Um, and what's thought to happen is the mosquito bites the possum, um, carries the bacteria, and then bites a human and transmits it to them. Um, there is thought to be a possible second source of transmission, which is not, not yet as established, being uh, from a penetrating skin injury where um, mycobacterium ulcerans in the environment, say from possum excreta, um, penetrates the skin, perhaps through an open wound or graze. Um, there's a bit more work going on to try and prove or disprove that. Um, and then finally, pleasingly, no evidence of any human-to-human -human transmission. So really, what we know is possums carry it, mosquitoes can carry it, and so it's thought to go from the possum to the human via mosquito bites. One of the supporting evidences of this is this map. So this is the map uh, about six or seven years ago of about 600 people who had a Borrelia ulcer, where on their body it was affected. Um, this is Victorian data. Um, and what you can see is it's largely um, what we would call exposed areas, the limbs. Um, and uh, that sort of matches up where people get mosquito bites, probably slightly more on the um, front than the back, um, but over the arms and the legs and a few bites on sort of the face, the neck, the back, uh, but really consistent with where people get mosquito bites. Early ulcers, for those who haven't seen them before, usually present as a really sort of small papule initially. Most people don't seek medical attention at that point, but it will then slowly ulcerate over weeks to months. Um, a small subset don't present as an ulcer. They present as chronic cellulitis or even chronic unilateral edema. And these ones are really, really hard to diagnose because there isn't the sort of characteristic ulcer of Borrelia ulcer. Um, pleasingly, systemic symptoms are extremely rare. So people don't normally present with fevers or, or anything else unless they've got a secondary bacterial infection on top of their Borrelia ulcer, which can, of course, occur. But really, the take home is to consider it in any person who presents with a lesion or cellulitis that doesn't improve with antibiotics or time, um, particularly one that lives in some of the, the at risk areas, which we'll get to in a second. Um, so really it, it takes a high degree of clinical suspicion um, and a lot of the time people will actually present because they've done their own research and say look I've heard about this Borrelia ulcer I've had this ulcer for, for weeks could this be in so a few different, more different examples uh, to see um, the one on the, the far left is a relatively early fairly superficial ulcer um, and then you get to the, the more established ulcer that's second from the left, which is um, quite obviously quite angry looking. But really what I want to draw your attention to there is uh, the sort of edge. It almost forms a bit of a lip, a bit like a, um, like a half pipe lip, lip uh, for sort of people that are familiar with skateboarding and things like that. Um, we call that an undermined edge. And what you can actually do is get your swab under it if you're examining it and, and investigating it. Um, and that's because the toxin produced by mycobacterium ulcerans has caused a layer of damage that's already caused damage under the edge. So that edge is not thickly adhered to the skin. It's actually loose and you can get swabs just under the edge. So that's a, a really characteristic feature of Borrelia ulcers. And then finally on the right, uh, this is uh, some images of a cellulitic presentation. So you can see there's no ulcer on this. Um, initially presenting as just sort of a small patch of erythema um, that progresses and still has an ulcerated um, and that's unilateral, hadn't responded to some initial antibiotics um, and uh, was still quite inflamed. In terms of who gets Borrelia ulcers, um, there's a really useful study 
people may have seen uh, referenced in the mainstream media that's come out of uh, Geelong in the Darwin Health team uh, a couple of months ago that did a, uh, a survey of people who had Borrelia ulcer in Victoria, um, a case control study using some match controls from, from the same areas. And what they found is that people with Borrelia ulcer tended to be more likely to have diabetes. They perhaps were more likely to take prednisolone, um, although this was a, a survey and, and that might be because they had prednisolone as part of their treatment for Borrelia ulcer. And they're more likely to have had a BCG vaccination. Um, people with Borrelia ulcer is more likely to have possums on their property, which matches how you get it. More likely to have bore water or ponds, um, which again can attract mosquito. And they're perhaps more likely to work outside with soil contact. All right, a little bit about the epidemiology. So um, this is from one of the Department of Health resources on Borrelia ulcer. Um, but what's really important for um, those working in inner Melbourne is that in 2021, we first identified cases of Borrelia ulcer acquired in inner northern Melbourne for the first time. And this is really significant. So if you can see on this map on the right, um, all the affected areas to that point are coastal. Um, Mornington Peninsula still is responsible for the most cases. Um, the Bellarine Peninsula has had sort of variable numbers over the last 30 years, but, but quite significant through um, sort of Point Lonsdale and Queenscliff in particular. Um, but really everything's coastal other than this little patch in inner Melbourne. So we're not sure how um, really also got to this region, but it has. Um, and there's now an increasing number of cases that are acquired here. Um, but led to the Department of Health putting out some um, alerts through the Chief Health Officer and through the media in 2022, listing a number of particular suburbs where transmission has been proven to occur. Um, so that's Essendon, Mooney Ponds, Brunswick West, Pasco Vale South and Strathmore. Um, or quite far from the beach, obviously. What we've seen over the last 10 years is that case numbers have generally increased. Now, given mosquitoes uh, the vector and given the long incubation time, um, what we tend to see is people usually get diagnosed between about June and November. That's about uh, an incubation period plus a few weeks to months for people to get diagnosed after the mosquito season. So while our numbers this year on the far right aren't as much as last year, they're, they're tracking ahead of this time last year by a little bit, not by a lot. Um, but what you can see is there's this overall trend over 10 years of case numbers increasing. The absolute numbers aren't that high, but each case carries you know, with it significant deformity, significant complications. Um, and so the, the upward trajectory is worrying. This is statewide. What's more alarming is once we look at the... Um, particular Marybeck and Mooney Valley LGAs. So they contain all those suburbs that we just talked about. It's a dramatic increase. So up until three years ago, there was only a handful of cases. Um, most of those, or all of those cases were people who had traveled to other areas um, and got their Borrelia ulcer and then uh, yeah, lived in, in Marybeck or Mooney Valley. But what you can see over the last two years, it's a, again, small absolute numbers, but a dramatic increase in the amount of Borrelia ulcer in people who live in Marybeck or Mooney Valley. And again, the 2023 figure on the far right, only slightly above last year's, but with um, a couple of months of diagnosis season to go, expecting it to be, end up significantly higher. We're tracking much, much higher numbers compared to this time last year. Now I can't show you individual case level data for obvious reasons as to where people live, but but what I can tell you is that about 90% of people from Marybeck and Mooney Valley that are diagnosed with Borrelia ulcer live inside this red box. And so uh, just highlighting those suburbs we talked about, um, and hopefully my mouse will project here, we've got Strathmore up in the sort of the, the northwest of this map, Essendon and Mooney Ponds, all part of the Mooney Valley LGA, Pasco Vale South, Coburg and Brunswick West. But really where we're seeing it is sort of the closer people are to the Mooney Ponds Creek, um, the denser the case numbers. So really Pasco Vale South is probably got the, the, one of the higher numbers of cases at the moment. Um, Essendon and Mooney Ponds are also having similarly high numbers. Now we haven't been able to prove any link to the Mooney Ponds Creek, but what we do know is mosquitoes like to live near creeks. It's a very uh, bushy area. There's, there's lots of trees and parkland and a lovely sort of walking path for those who know the area. Um, so that you know, it's a good home for possums, it's a good home for mosquitoes, so it makes sense that um, a lot of cases might live near there. 
Now, I've added Coburg to that map. That's not an official transmission area, but we do know that there are some people who live in Coburg who have been diagnosed with Borrelia ulcer. Um, what we haven't been able to prove yet is whether they have uh, got it in Coburg or they've got it because if you live in Coburg, you're pretty likely to spend some time in Pasco Vale South and Brunswick West as well. Um, so that's an area of ongoing investigation for us just to work out if Borrelia ulcer spread. But... Um, this is sort of where all the action is happening at the moment. Um, as I said, the closer to the sort of this Mooney Ponds Creek, the higher the density, but really most of these cases are in this area. So um, for anyone listening whose um, practice is in this area or um, live in this area, um, hopefully you've heard from us through, through your practice. Um, we do really want to sort of promote awareness. Um, and that being said, if you're working in another part of Melbourne, still, I think, really relevant to know this because it is a really common area where people travel. Perhaps they go to school or they work or they walk in this area or ride bikes. Um, and as I said, we're doing a bit of work to work out if uh, this area has, if there's going to be spread outside this area um, with transmission occurring outside it. All right, uh, just a little bit on testing. Um, so for those who, who don't know, a Mycobacterium ulcerans, which is the, the causative bacteria, will not grow on a standard uh, culture swab. It just takes too long. It usually takes, um, as I said, at the bottom about eight weeks to grow. Um, but the Mycobacterium ulcerans PCR is a fantastic PCR. It's highly sensitive, highly specific, as long as a, as a sample is collected properly. So using a dry swab um, dedicated to this PCR, um, so, so a separate one to uh, an MCS that you might be doing at the same time, really trying to get in there at the edge of the lesion under that undermined edge we talked about a, a few minutes ago, trying to make sure you can see something on the swab to see that some, some biological material is there for the PCR to work on. Um, occasionally, we'll do a mycobacterial culture swab as well. Um, that's mainly to assess if there's been antibiotic failure. Um, so someone whose lesion is not getting better despite treatment, but it takes a very, very long time. So it's not a practical diagnostic test um, because it takes two to three months to get a result. Um, and finally, if there's no ulcer there, if it's one of those sort of cellulitis or edema presentations that we've talked about, um, you can do a skin biopsy and do the PCR on that biopsy specimen, just sending it in a, a, an empty sterile jar. Um, all testing is done in Victoria, at least, at Vidral, the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Lab, but all primary labs will uh, send their samples there for testing. Management. Um, so just to, to outline, management should usually be undertaken in collaboration with an ID physician, um, just uh, mainly because the antibiotic treatment is quite complex. They're not sort of antibiotics that are, that are commonly used, and there's often a lot of side effects and toxicity. Um, the antibiotics is eight weeks of combination treatment. Um, rifampicin is usually the backbone of treatment, plus any one of clarithromycin, moxifloxacin, and ciprofloxacin. Um, the reason we use combination treatment is because if you use one drug on its own, there's a higher chance of developing resistance to treatment. Um, there's been no studies that have compared regimens. Um, all seem to be quite effective. So uh, we, when we're choosing which antibiotic for each patient, it depends a little bit on them. You know, what side effects are they more likely to get or less likely to get? Are they on other drugs that will interact? Um, surgery is no longer part of the routine management of Borrelia ulcer, uh, but is used in some, some specific circumstances I've list, listed there. So those extensively necrotic ulcers that usually present later. Um, to excise a lesion if antibiotic therapy is not um, possible or uh, practical, and sometimes to repair a large defect and hasten wound closure. So in someone that's had antibiotic therapy, is left with a large defect that, that will take a long, long time to heal, there's a role there for sometimes doing a, a skin graft to close it over, but antibiotic therapy always sort of goes in first to promote the success of that skin graft. Um, about 20% of cases who are started on antibiotic treatment subsequently develop a paradoxical reaction. This means that they get, uh, they, they usually come in, usually to yourselves or, or their managing GP first and say it's getting worse. Um, they present with pain, they present with induration or erythema and sometimes discharge. 
And what this is, is uh, actually the their immune system re reacting to the bacteria as the antibiotics start to kill it off. So they develop this increasingly significant localized response and um, uh, usually are quite concerned by it if they haven't been warned about it beforehand. When we see them, the main thing we have to make sure is that this isn't a genuine worsening of things, which usually is because they're either not taking their antibiotics correctly or um, there's been some other failure of antibiotic treatment, perhaps having the wrong thing. Um, it's pretty uncommon, uh, but sometimes we'll send that sort of mycobacterium culture to see. Um, but the, the other treatment is, is either to, to watch and wait or to add oral prednisolone um, to really sort of dampen down that immune response. So I said, that one in five cases get this, and if you don't warn them about it beforehand, they can be quite concerned. So just a few tips on management that, that we, or at least I tell people when I'm starting them on treatment um, and are, are useful for yourselves to know about if you're sort of supporting somebody on treatment or, or treating them yourselves. Um, really important to warn somebody that the ulcer will still be present after finishing antibiotics. So usually these ulcers have developed over weeks to months. The antibiotics kill the mycobacteria that's there, um, but the ulcer heals with time. And really, it's only once the mycobacteria have been, been killed that the ulcer will heal over. So um, usually we get to the end of treatment, um, stop their end of treatment, and we often find people a bit hesitant or a bit nervous because they've still got a decent-sized ulcer. And it will take, you know, usually weeks, sometimes months to heal over from there. So important to warn somebody before starting them and to and for you as a, as a GP to know that. Um, really important to warn patients about that risk of paradoxical reactions prior to starting therapy. If, if it gets worse, um, then that can be a, you know, quite alarming. Um, and then to be aware of drug reactions, particularly with rifampicin. So um, rifampicin, um, as you, you know, will, will know when you're prescribing software, will tell you interacts with a high number of medications. Um, some of them are induced, and so they, they means the body gets rid of them further. Some of them it slows down the body's metabolism. And so um, really, if you're, if you're starting any treatment while somebody's on rifampicin, um, important to check interactions. Um, certainly when we, we commence somebody on rifampicin, for, whether it's for borreliosis or something else, we, have, we always check it very thoroughly and warn them about uh, alternative or complementary medicines that might do the same. Uh, and just finally, a little bit on prevention. So um, as we've talked about, uh, that the the mechanism of infection of really ulcer is uh, through mosquitoes spreading mycobacterium ulcerans from possums to humans. Um, possums are a protected species. Not every possum has mycobacterium ulcerans. Um, we don't recommend any, any actions directed at possums because that will get you in trouble with the government. Um, so it's really all about preventing mosquito bite. Um, so there are obviously different ways to do that. One is to, to reduce breeding sites such as pooled water. Um, so uh, we're trying to do some messaging in, in the affected areas that uh, if you live there to try and make sure you don't have, you know, kids' toys gathering water or buckets full of water and things like that because that uh, promotes mosquito um, uh, eggs and, and hatching. Um, to wear protective clothing when you're outside and use insect repellent, you know, all to avoid bites. Uh, and to watch any, wash any cuts, scratches or bites and apply an antiseptic soon after you notice them. So. Um, a little bit about preventing mosquitoes getting there, preventing them biting, and then trying to limit the damage if you've had a bite or a scratch. Um, what we also know is no one of those things works on its own. It's really important to do a, a combination approach to try and decrease the risk of transmission. Um, now, I've, I've run through a lot of it here. What I do want to reference, um, and, and you may be aware of this, is through the health pathways, um, through the, the PHN. It's a really good resource on Bruley Ulcer that is uh, up to date with the right sort of history um, targeted for what we do in Victoria. Um, I've just captured a snapshot here, but it does go through history, what things to look for, how to test for it, and a little bit about the management there too. Um, so if you see somebody and you're in doubt or you want to just check on, check on making sure you, you're thinking about the right things or doing the right steps, it's a really great resource that you can access to um, support your management of your patient. So just to summarise a few key points uh, we've gone through. So Brulee ulcer is now definitively established in inner Melbourne. Um, we've listed a few suburbs where we know it is. Um, I guess what we don't know is whether it will spread. Possums and mosquitoes 
don't tend to respect suburban boundaries, so they may um, spread further. And we'll do a, we're going to do a bit of work to try and identify this um, for yourselves to consider broadly ulcer in any person that presents with a chronic unexplained ulcer, nodule, or cellulitis. So whilst the map I showed earlier showed some of the, the acquisition zones, you know, people move across Victoria often enough that they could be living anywhere in Victoria and develop a broadly ulcer, and many won't recall where they got bitten because of that four to five month incubation period. Um, to diagnose Mycobacterium's PCR, use a dry swab um, around the edge, send it for that dedicated PCR. Management is in conjunction with ID physicians, but it is antibiotic therapy with surgery there as an adjuvant. Um, and finally, prevention is really about the avoidance of mosquito bites, particularly in affected areas, um, but uh, that's an area that we're still doing some research on to scope it out. Um, if you do have any follow-up questions or things today, you can certainly reach out uh, to your local public health unit for those that live uh, or that are working in, in Marybeck, Melbourne and West in Melbourne. That's us, the Western Public Health Unit, um, which uh, details there. Um, if, you're, if your practice is from sort of Darabin um, East uh, and you're in the, the Northwestern PHN, it might be the Northeast Public Health Unit who, um, if you Google them, you'll get their details too based out of the Austin. Uh, and just finally, I'll get to the, the Q&A in a second. Um, but after uh, this session, you'll get an email with the slides and, and some further information and get it in attendance if you over the next 46 weeks. But we certainly encourage you to, to provide us some feedback on this session, um, what's helpful, what's not, um, uh, by scanning this QR code. And through the PHN resources page, you can get uh, this recording within the next week and information on future sessions. Um, just in the last couple of minutes, just turning to the to the Q and A, I can see a question about has Mycobacterium ulcerans been isolated in possums or possum screen or mosquitoes around the Mooney Ponds Creek area? Uh, there has been some work, so the, the Doherty Department is doing um, uh, some environment has done some environmental sampling uh, last summer and have found a number of possums and possum excreta affected, um, in particular around around that area. Um, we haven't been able to prove any direct link to the to the creek itself, um, but we've definitely proven uh, possums have been affected, um, found possums with Brule ulcers um, and found excreta with uh, Mycobacterium ulcerans as well. Um, so we're just in the in the planning stages for the upcoming mosquito season, which is really just just kicking off now and going through to April about what sort of environmental sampling we can do to see, um, I guess, whether it's becoming more dense and um, targeting some other areas to see if it's spread as well. Um, so yes, we definitely know it's there. These are not people that have got, got it from other parts of Melbourne, which which is you know a reasonable we'll think about. Um, does anyone else have any other questions they'd like to ask before we finish up today? If not, then I'd like just like to say thank you for joining us. Um, as I said, if you if you if you'd like to reach out afterwards, um, my details I'll make sure are in the sort of summary email that comes across. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us, and uh, have a good rest of the day. <laughs>